Erin Miller, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, inherited arrhythmias. Hello, my name is Erin Miller. I'm a clinical genetic counselor at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I specialize in cardiovascular genetics with specific interests in pediatric cardiomyopathy, arrhythmia, and aortopathy. This section is part of a larger cardiology overview and will focus on the more common inherited arrhythmias for which genetic evaluation and testing are indicated. Um, and I'll also talk a bit about sudden cardiac death and sudden cardiac arrest. As a whole, the inherited arrhythmias are a preventable but known cause of sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death in individuals of all ages. They primarily include sodium and potassium channelopathies as well as other arrhythmogenic mechanisms. Today we're going to talk more about long QT syndrome, catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, Brugada syndrome, and sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. While genetic counseling and testing for cardiovascular disease is not necessarily new, it really has yet to be fully integrated into the front line of clinical cardiology care. There are, however, established guidelines in place recommending both genetic counseling and genetic testing as part of standard clinical care for both inherited arrhythmias and cardiomyopathies. These recommendations acknowledge the impact genetic counseling and testing have on both patients and their at-risk relatives. You'll see these guidelines referenced throughout this series, published in 2011 by the Heart Rhythm Society and the European Heart Rhythm Association. They remain the most current and comprehensive guidelines for genetic testing and genetic counseling. You'll see here the different strengths of recommendations, such that genetic testing is recommended for individuals with a suspected clinical diagnosis of long QT syndrome with or without cardiovascular symptoms, individuals with a suspected clinical diagnosis of CPVT, and then also for individuals who have a known family history of long QT syndrome, CPVT, or Brugada syndrome. I've included here as well recommendations for postmortem genetic testing for cases of sudden unexplained or sudden infant death, um, primarily involving the collection of a blood sample on individuals um, by the coroner or medical examiner's office. The strength of recommendations for genetic testing for Brugada syndrome are a bit less strong, and they're outlined by these guidelines um, as potentially being useful, and then suggest that genetic testing be considered for individuals who are asymptomatic um, but have QT prolongation um, simply not to the degree that, um, that may be seen in, in some cases. So this table also comes from the Heart Rhythm and European Heart Rhythm Association guidelines. Um, the overall genetic testing yield for these different arrhythmia phenotypes is relatively high compared to other commonly performed clinical genetic testing, say compared to um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome testing. In the vast majority of cases, the yield is, is not quite so high. And while the specific yield varies for each individual and depends upon their clinical and family history, um, the overall yields are summarized here. So you can see for long QT syndrome, the yield of clinical genetic testing in someone with a confirmed diagnosis approaches 75%. For CPVT, it approaches 60%. And for Brugada syndrome, it's a bit lower at 20%. I've added here on the bottom the yield of genetic testing for sudden unexplained death um, and sudden infant death, and this applies to cases that are autopsy negative, so post-mortem uh, examinations were completed and the underlying cause of death remains unknown. The yield of genetic testing ranges from 20 to 25 percent, with the vast majority of positive results occurring in a gene that's known to be associated with either long QT syndrome or in the ryanodine receptor 2 gene, which is the most common gene associated with CPVT. I'd like to talk a bit more about um, each of these diagnoses in, in more detail. We'll explore long QT syndrome first in the context of a case example. So I saw this infant boy who was born at 30 weeks following a pregnancy complicated by a shortened cervix, and that was really the, the primary cause of the premature delivery, um, as well as maternal trileptal exposure during the pregnancy. Um, the baby was actually doing quite well, was transferred to the newborn intensive care unit around eight days of age, primarily for feeding and growth. 
Screening electrocardiograms were completed here and demonstrated QT prolongation ranging from 455 to 551 milliseconds. There was some thought that potentially the EKG findings were related to maternal trileptal use and breast milk. However, the findings persisted even after supplementing with formula. So here's a look at the initial family history that was collected. Um, you see down here our index case, the baby with QT prolongation, shaded in gray, indicating that he has findings suggestive of long QT syndrome. His father um, is 25 years of age, reportedly healthy. We had recommended that he have a screening EKG um, because of his son's history, and it was normal, no evidence of QT prolongation. And then his mother, who's 23 years of age, she has a history of ADHD and seizures. She had been followed by neurology here um, as, as a young teen for idiopathic localization-related epilepsy and had reportedly had good seizure control on trileptal. Her first seizure occurred around the age of five years during her sleep. She did have urinary incontinence with that event. Her second seizure occurred around the age of 10 when she was cheering in the stands at a basketball game. And then her most recent seizure occurred just prior to this pregnancy. It was early in the morning. She reports um, feeling a great amount of stress due to some um, social circumstances and was walking to the bathroom when she had an event. She reports having less than 10 seizures over her lifetime. Um, she did have screening ECGs done at our institution prior to initiation or shortly after initiation of her um, seizure medication, so she was around the ages of 12 and 13, and her QTC on those ECGs from a, a number of years ago ranged from 461 to 485 milliseconds. The remainder of the family history was negative for cases of sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death, no known inherited arrhythmias, um, no unexplained deaths, no individuals who had um, ICD placement or ICD therapies. So let's talk a bit more about long QT syndrome. Um, it's the figure here on the right summarizes the electrocardiogram and clinical features of long QT, which is a condition characterized by QT prolongation and T wave abnormalities. You can see here in this schematic um, the characteristic T wave pattern associated with LQT1, this broad-based, uh, sorry, this broad-based T wave and then this notched T wave, that's the characteristic pattern associated with long QT2, and a late peaking T wave, the characteristic pattern associated with long QT type 3. Um, individuals with, with QT prolongation have a predisposition for syncope seizures and, of course, sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. Um, the distinct form of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, often associated with a prolonged QT interval, is referred to as torsade de point, and you can see that outlined here. Um, long QT syndrome has an estimated prevalence of approximately 1 in 2,000 to 1 in 3,000. There's marked clinical and genetic heterogeneity, as is seen with many inherited cardiac diseases. Um, the variability can range from an individual who is asymptomatic throughout their lifetime to someone who experiences sudden death during infancy. So a bit of history about long QT syndrome. The first documented um, ECG finding of QT prolongation was described in 1957 by Dr. Gervell and Dr. Lang Nielsen. You may recognize these names as, the as an autosomal recessive form of long QT syndrome referred to as Gervell Lang Nielsen syndrome um, was named after these gentlemen. Gervell Lang Nielsen syndrome is characterized, of course, by QT prolongation um, in addition to sensory neural hearing loss. I'll talk a bit more about that later. In 1979, the International Long QT Syndrome Registry was established. This certainly laid the groundwork for identification of the genes causing Long QT syndrome. Uh, the primary genes were identified in 1995. And then in 2004, the first clinical genetic testing for Long QT syndrome became available. So we've had access to clinical genetic testing for a little over 10 years now. Certainly in that time frame, the technologies have changed dramatically, changing our ability to look at a greater number of genes um, and also reducing the cost. So a diagnosis of long QT syndrome is, of course, 
uh, characterized by QT prolongation on a resting EKG. Although individuals with long QT syndrome can have a normal EKG and also an individual who is healthy without long QT syndrome may have evidence of QT prolongation um, on ECG. So one electrocardiogram demonstrating QT prolongation certainly does not confirm a diagnosis of this condition. Um, the initial Schwartz criteria were defined in 1993, and you see the updated version here on the left. Um, they were updated in 2011 primarily to incorporate the exercise tres um, stress testing with the evidence of an abnormal QT response uh, during recovery. The Schwartz score is used to assess the clinical probability of long QT syndrome based on electrocardiogram findings as well as personal and family history. And then Sylvia Priori in 2013 also established other methods of diagnosing or confirming a diagnosis of long QT syndrome in a proband, including individuals who have a QTC interval greater than 500 milliseconds on repeated ECGs, as well as identification of a pathogenic variant. There are both acquired and genetic causes of long QT syndrome. Um, as you all, I'm sure, are quite familiar, there are a number of different medications that are known to prolong the QT interval. Individuals with extreme electrolyte imbalances can also have evidence of QT prolongation in individuals with structural heart disease. So, of course, when assessing someone with the finding of QT prolongation, looking for things that um, could be the underlying cause of this is, is important. In terms of genetic causes, of course, congenital long QT syndrome is the focus of the talk today. Uh, I did want to mention that there are some genetic syndromes that have QT prolongation as a known feature, such as Williams syndrome and Rett syndrome. I've had on occasion a referral um, to evaluate an individual for long QT syndrome who has a known genetic condition such as Rett syndrome. And while it's certainly possible that an individual could have more than one underlying genetic diagnosis, the suspicion for a secondary diagnosis of long QT syndrome is substantially less if this finding is a known feature of the disorder. The vast majority of individuals with long QT syndrome have a, a genetic change or a pathogenic variant occurring in one of three genes. Um, this is an, it's primarily an autosomal dominant disorder, meaning that if a parent has a diagnosis of long QT syndrome, that each of their children has a 50-50 chance of inheriting that risk. And most often, long QT syndrome is um, observed with arrhythmia being an isolated finding, meaning there are not extra cardiac features associated uh, with the diagnosis. gervell lang nielsen syndrome, which I mentioned previously, is an autosomal recessive form of long QT syndrome such that both parents would be carriers and would have a 25% chance of having an affected child. This condition is, is also um, characterized by QT prolongation, but is also seen with congenital profound sensory neural hearing loss. So if you see QT prolongation in the setting of deafness, um, you certainly want to be considering uh, dravell lang nielsen syndrome. There are a couple of other syndromes that are associated with uh, extra cardiac features in addition to long QT. One is anderson tawil This is caused by variants within the KCNJ2 gene. anderson tawil syndrome um, is observed with, in addition to QT prolongation, uh, periodic, periodic paralysis and dysmorphic features. Those features can include micronathia, some dental abnormalities, uh, a curved fifth finger some other facial features. Uh, Timothy syndrome is another syndrome characterized by QT prolongation in addition to congenital heart disease, uh, neurologic impairment, so autism spectrum disorders are quite common in this population, um, and dysmorphic features as well, such as low set ears and a small upper jaw, a thin upper lip, um, and small misplaced teeth with frequent dental cavities. This table here outlines the 15 genes known to be associated with long QT syndrome. You see here KCNQ1, KCNH2, and SCN5A. They account for the largest percentage of cases of long QT syndrome. I've included gervell lang nielsen syndrome here um, in correlation with the two genes that are known to cause this condition, as well as KCNJ2 and the correlation with anderson tawil syndrome and CACNA1C and the correlation with Timothy syndrome. Many of the, the current gene panels that are available for long QT syndrome include all 15 of these genes. Some include a subset. 
there are some targeted panels that look just at these first three genes um, with, with the understanding that they account for the underlying molecular cause in the vast majority of cases. I thought that sharing this table might be helpful as it outlines the similarities and differences between the most common types of long QT syndrome, types 1, 2, and 3. You see here that type 1 um, affects a potassium channel. It's a loss of function effect. Um, it accounts for 30 to 35 percent of cases of long QT syndrome. And as I showed you before, the characteristic T wave pattern of this broad-based T wave. The, the triggers that are known to be associated with long QT1 include exercise or exertion, emotional stress, um, uh, response or to sleep or startle. And the penetrance associated with long QT syndrome is, is relatively high, meaning that close to 90% of individuals with LQT1 will have evidence of QT prolongation on their ECG. Um, around 60% of so will have syncopal events. Long QT syndrome 2 is caused by variants in the KCNH2 gene. This is also encodes for a potassium channel and is associated with loss of function. This accounts for 25 to 30 percent of cases. You see here the characteristic T wave pattern of a notched T wave. While exertion can also uh, be associated with uh, a trigger or cardiac event with long QT type 2, you're more often to see uh, emotional ability or stress associated with um, a cardiac event. And then response to sleep is also more common with long QT type 2 than type 1. And again, penetrance, so greater than 80% of individuals will have QT prolongation on a resting ECG, and just less than half um, may experience syncope. Long QT syndrome type 3 is the least common. It's caused by gain-of-function mutations in the SCN5A gene. It accounts again for just 5 to 10 percent, and what you see on EKG typically would be a late peaking T wave. Exertion is typically not a trigger for individuals with long QT syndrome type 3, so this certainly affects how, how the patient and family are counseled and what kind of um, activity and lifestyle changes might, might be associated with this diagnosis. Uh, emotional uh, responses or stress is, are also less often associated with a, with a syncopal event or are a trigger for an arrhythmia, um, but sort of rest and, and sleep are more often uh, seen to be associated with an event. These individuals are quite likely to have QT prolongation on resting ECG with 95% um, having ECG findings and have a lower chance of syncope uh, over a lifetime, although actually have the highest chance of presenting with a sudden cardiac arrest. So clinical genetic testing is available, of course, for long QT syndrome. Um, the number of genes that are included on the panels, as I've alluded to before, uh, vary from laboratory, and many laboratories may offer different testing options. The majority of, of gene variants are loss of function mutations in either KCNQ1 or KCNH2, accounting for long QT types 1 or 2. Uh, 5 to 10 percent, of course, are related to gain of function mutations in SCN5A. While most of the, the gene variants associated with long QT syndrome are, are missense mutations or, or single nucleotide changes, about 3 to 10 percent of individuals with long QT syndrome can have a larger deletion or duplication involving one of these common genes. And then as with other inherited cardiac conditions as well, some individuals and families may have uh, a pathogenic variant in more than one gene or two pathogenic variants in the same gene. So if we return to our case, um, we did end up requesting a long QT syndrome gene panel in our newborn boy who, as you saw, had evidence of QT prolongation. Um, and his mother had a history uh, of QT prolongation a, a number of years ago. We requested a, a more targeted panel, so it included sequencing of the genes associated with the three most common types of long QT syndrome. And then I've included here the Heart Rhythm Society guidelines that just recommend genetic testing for a suspected clinical diagnosis with or without symptoms when the QT interval is greater than 480 milliseconds. We received our results back. They were positive. We identified a pathogenic variant in the KCNH2 gene um, at amino acid position 633. The laboratory interpreted this to be pathogenic or disease causing, and we agreed. So this confirmed a diagnosis of long QT syndrome type 2 in our index case, or the proband.
This particular variant had been observed in multiple unrelated individuals previously and had been shown to co-segregate with disease in other families. So just a little bit about genotype-phenotype correlations and gender as it relates to long QT2. So the probability of sudden cardiac arrest for individuals with long QT syndrome type 2 over a lifetime differs based on gender. gender. It's higher among women than men. There's a specific risk period for women in the peripartum period, which of course comes into play for our case as um, our, our proband or the index case was a, a newborn. The mother had just given birth. Um, when looking at risks for men and women, they were similar in childhood, uh, but tended to, to continue to increase for women over a lifetime. And there's a specific location within the KCNH2 gene associated with an increased risk for sudden cardiac arrest, specifically in men. So those individuals are those men who have a variant in the KCNH2 gene between amino acid position 404 and 659. You see that outlined here in this P-loop domain in the figure on the right. Our patient, um, as you saw in the prior slide, had a mutation at position 633. So this falls certainly within the poor loop domain. So if we return to our family history again, here we have our, our proband. His genetic testing again revealed a pathogenic variant in KCNH2 confirming a diagnosis of long QT2. Um, we recommended genetic testing in his family. We elected to start with testing in his mother as she had a history suggestive of long QT syndrome as well. Um, we subsequently tested his grandmother, maternal grandmother, who tested negative. So not surprisingly, his mother was positive. And this finding had some significant implications for her management, including the need for beta blocker therapy and establishing cardiology care and follow-up. I think also there was some further consideration regarding the etiology of her seizures, and while it was certainly possible she could have seizures and long QT syndrome type 2, it's quite possible that her seizure events previously were secondary to a primary arrhythmia. Um, and again, in testing her mother, it allowed us to remove risk for her three maternal half-siblings. Um, we've been unable to test her father. He lives out of state um, in a rehab facility due to a prior stroke. Sort of details regarding that are not, are not well known, unfortunately, at this time. I wanted to, to share with you as well this genotype-phenotype uh, risk stratification guide that was published um, back in 2013. And this essentially outlines risk groups based on the previously published probability of experiencing a first or recurrent cardiac event, be it syncope, seizure, sudden cardiac arrest, or death, before the age of 40 years in untreated individuals. So this is in the absence of therapeutic interventions. And just to point out to you, for example, um, intermediate risk would include uh, female sex with a diagnosis consistent with long QT type 2, and high risk in individuals with long QT2 who have a QT interval greater than 500 milliseconds. So certainly um, our proband or index cases mother would fall into this high risk category um, warranting further, further cardiac treatment and evaluation related to the diagnosis of long QT syndrome. So just a summary of the diagnostic implications for long QT certainly allows for risk stratification and diagnosis of asymptomatic relatives. While in our case example, the KCNH2 variant was inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern, as is most often seen, de novo mutations do occur. These are mutations that are present in the probander index case, but were not inherited from either the mother or the father. And also autosomal recessive inheritance is possible, which would certainly change appro your approach to the family history. The other thing I wanted to point out is that genetic testing can be really powerful in the evaluation of family members as well um, because individuals may have the genetic predisposition and be at risk for inherited arrhythmia but not have evidence of QT prolongation on a resting EKG. Um, and of course it can allow us to confirm a suspected clinical diagnosis as well. In terms of prognostic and therapeutic implications, we know that individuals with long QT type 3 have the highest mortality per event. They're less likely to experience a syncopal event, but if they do, um, it's more likely to be a sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death.
In terms of therapeutic implications, beta blocker therapy is the primary treatment for most individuals with long QT type 1 and type 2. Lifestyle modifications, including activity restrictions, um, may not always be recommended. Um, it depends, again, on the, the specific QT interval and the medical and family history, but um, activity restriction may be recommended for individuals with type 1 and type 2. Really, genetic testing is used in conjunction with clinical data to determine treatment, and all individuals should avoid QT prolonging medications and maintain adequate hydration and normal electrolyte levels. You certainly would want to avoid someone having sort of a benign fainting or syncopal event. Uh, if they have a diagnosis of long QT syndrome, I think that would be quite worrisome, even if they may have fainted or passed out for some other reason. We'll transition now to talk a bit more about catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which I'll refer to as CPVT moving forward. So this condition is characterized by episodic syncope occurring during exercise or acute emotion in individuals who have a structurally normal heart. Um, with this condition, um, the, the EKG, resting EKG is typically normal. Individuals often present with either exertion or acute emotional stress. Um, causing, uh, caused by the onset of ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular fibrillation during stress or emotion is the presenting symptom only in a minority of individuals, and most often this is associated with exertion. The prevalence of CPVT is approximately 1 in 10,000. The mean age of onset is between 7 and 9 years of age, however onset as late as the fourth decade of life has been reported. If untreated, CPVT is it can be lethal. Approximately 30% of affected individuals experience at least one cardiac arrest um, and up to 80% one or more syncopal events. The penetrance is also quite high. More than 80% will experience a symptom over their lifetime and CPVT has been a reported cause of SIDS. As I mentioned before, most individuals uh, with CPVT have a normal resting EKG. PVCs may be seen, but it typically would be the only EKG abnormality. And exercise stress testing is the most important diagnostic tool, as this really elicits the bidirectional or polymorphic tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia that's, that's most often seen with this. Um, stress testing isn't completely sensitive. 20% of affected individuals may have a normal exercise test as well. So when we think about genetic testing for CPVT, the overall yield of testing, meaning the likelihood of identifying a pathogenic variant in an affected individual is between 55 and 65 percent. And with this condition, as in many others, a negative genetic testing result doesn't exclude the diagnosis, of course. The number of genes that are included on different panels varies. Um, the most commonly associated gene is the ryanidine receptor 2 gene, or RYR2. Most often, missense mutations have been reported in RYR2. However, larger deletions have been reported as well. Less often, you can see sequence variants or, or missense variants in the COLM1 gene. While again, most of the time CP CPVT is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, there are autosomal recessive forms of, as well, primarily caused by um, variants in the CASQ2 gene. These account for maybe approximately 2-5% to 5 of cases. The diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic implications of a diagnosis of CPVT include, again, confirmation of suggested clinical diagnosis, identification of at-risk family members. At this time, there really are limited genotype, phenotype data available. Um, there are actually some new um, genotype, phenotype data for individuals who have deletions of the ryanidine receptor 2 gene, and I'm going to be discussing a case um, in a later section in the results section of this series. Um, that of a deletion of the RYR2 gene. We'll talk now a bit more about Brugada syndrome. This condition is characterized by cardiac conduction abnormalities and cardiac events occurring primarily during rest or sleep. ECG um, may demonstrate ST segment abnormalities. You can also see first degree AV block, conduction delay, right bundle branch block, and sick sinus syndrome. The prevalence of Brugada syndrome is unknown. Um, but is reported to be approximately 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 10,000. The penetrance is reduced. Approximately 20 to 30% of individuals have an ECG diagnostic of Brugada syndrome, 
um, and approximately 80% manifest the characteristic uh, electrocardium changes when challenged with a sodium channel blocker. The most uh, most individuals with Brugada syndrome um, are male and present in their 30s or 40s. I certainly rely upon my cardiology colleagues um, to confirm the diagnosis of Brugada syndrome and the presence of a Brugada pattern, but thought it would be helpful to include the, the diagnostic criteria here. So a diagnosis really requires presence of a type 1 Brugada pattern, either on resting ECG or with a sodium channel blocker. In addition to a history of ventricular fibrillation or polymorphic VT, uh, or a clinical history of syncope or nocturnal agonal respiration. Family history also plays a role in the diagnosis, so individuals with a type 1 pattern who have a family history of sudden cardiac death or a family history of Brugada type ECGs um, would also support a diagnosis. Current uh, guidelines also incorporate the presence of a pathogenic variant in a Brugada syndrome gene into the overall criteria. Of course, a diagnosis of Brugada syndrome can be difficult as the ECG pattern fluctuates even in individuals with a definite diagnosis. A possible diagnosis of Brugada syndrome includes a type 2 or type 3 ECG pattern with conversion to a type 1 pattern with drug challenge, in addition to ventricular fibrillation, the presence of polymorphic VT, um, history of syncope or a nocturnal agonal respiration, and again, a family history of sudden cardiac death or a family history of, of Brugada type ECGs. Again, a diagnosis of Brugada syndrome can be difficult due to the fluctuating ECG patterns. Um, however, you know, it does require a type 1 pattern, specifically in the right precordial leads. Elevated electrode placement ECGs um, employ the use of higher than normal placement of the right precordial leads when recording an ECG and have been shown to increase the sensitivity um, of the Brugada pattern. You see here the ECG patterns from an individual with Brugada syndrome showing the most severe ST abnormalities in leads overlying right ventricular, the right ventricular outflow tract, which is shaded here in gray. So these two leads. You see the cove type ST segment in the second and third intercostal spaces, but it's less obvious in the, the fourth intercostal space. So we often will utilize these um, elevated electrode placement, or Brugada ECGs as we call them, uh, in, our in our patient population when we're trying to confirm a diagnosis or evaluate an individual for a suspected diagnosis or evaluate at-risk family members. Clinical genetic testing is available for Brugada syndrome. Um, the yield of testing is not, as, not quite as high as for long QT syndrome or CPVT and ranges from around 15 to 30 percent. The vast majority of individuals with Brugada syndrome will have a pathogenic variant in the SCN5A gene. You will recall that variants in SCN5A can also cause long QT syndrome type 3, and in fact, they can cause other types of inherited arrhythmias and heart muscle diseases as well. The difference really between SCN5A variants causing long QT type 3 and Brugada syndrome is that with Brugada syndrome, what we see is a loss of function, and with long QT type 3, we see a gain of function. Most of the time, um, gene testing for Brugada syndrome is offered as part of a larger gene panel. There's a, a number of different genes that have been designated as associated with Brugada syndrome, but for many of these genes, there's limited information available. And so I th oftentimes clinically struggle with whether or not to order single gene testing for Brugada syndrome, looking at just, just at NC SCN5A, or to look at a larger panel um, evaluating uh, more of the genes. And a lot of that decision making comes from how suspicious you are of the diagnosis and the presence or absence of a family history and your ability to potentially confirm co-segregation with disease in the family. The management of Brugada syndrome in affected individuals um, includes placement of an ICD if there's a history of syncope or cardiac arrest, as well as antiarrhythmic medications. Individuals that are at risk, we offer screening ECGs every one to two years. Sometimes we consider um, initiating a sodium channel blocker challenge to determine that individual's level of risk or diagnostic status if, if um, gene testing is negative. And then in both affected and at-risk individuals, avoidance of medications with sodium blocking effects, such as a number of different anesthetics, antidepressants, and antipsychotics, and aggressive management of fever. Fever has been known to elicit um, a Brugada pattern and, and arrhythmias.
So genetic testing can help confirm a clinically uncertain diagnosis of Brugada syndrome. As with the other inherited arrhythmias, known variant testing and at-risk relatives may help guide individuals to take appropriate precautions, again, including avoidance of certain medications and aggressive fever management. At this time, however, there's limited prognostic and therapeutic value, as most of the treatment is based on the clinical cardiac findings and testing. I'm going to transition now to talk a bit more about sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. While not common, sudden cardiac death has a devastating impact on families, care providers, and the community, and attracts significant public and media attention. Understandably, parents and families and even care providers are often quite anxious and worried about surviving relatives. There's often a desire to initiate cardiac screening in family members, however, I might argue that normal cardiac testing results in relatives may provide false reassurance that the cause of death really is unknown. Lack of knowledge about the cause of sudden cardiac death poses the greatest challenge in understanding the potential heritability of the underlying disease and the risk for sudden cardiac death in relatives. I think as a healthcare community, we all play a role in identifying and referring appropriate families. This includes pediatricians, family physicians, medical examiners, and of course, cardiologists and genetic counselors as well. I encourage um, others to consider referral for genetic counseling in the case of a a sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death um, to a genetic counselor. Not only can the genetic counselor help investigate and and help confirm the underlying cause of death in a a family member, but can provide psychosocial support and and counseling to these families who are, are often in the middle of the grieving process. Clues that are important when evaluating a case of sudden cardiac arrest or death, of course, the family history, um, all medical records and and post-mortem examinations, and of course, the context of the cardiac event. What was occurring at the time that the person died or or had the arrest? Were they sleeping? Was it triggered by an an emotional stress or an an acoustic trigger? Um, What was the age of the individual? What was the gender of the individual? All of these things can help narrow down the differential. So if the cause of death is known, either prior to the death of the individual or identified in in post-mortem evaluations, screening should be based for family members on disease-specific recommendations. And there are screening guidelines for cardiomyopathies and inherited arrhythmias. So at what age should cardiac imaging um, or EKG screening be started? What specific tests should be offered to those individuals and how often um, if they have an affected family member who, who passed away because of a known heritable cardiac disease? An evaluation of family members should ideally proceed outward from the index case in a logical and stepwise fashion, and I know this isn't often the case, but typically we would start with evaluating first-degree relatives of a, of a deceased individual or an affected individual, so parents, siblings, and children, and then extend recommendations once you are more informed about their clinical or gene status. I've included here a table that outlines the yield of genetic testing for Um, cardiac diseases that are known to be associated with an increased risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, I apologize, it looks like uh, this is blocked out, but at the bottom, the yield of of postmortem genetic testing for sudden unexplained death is approximately 26%. Um, You can see that the highest yield is for long QT syndrome, followed by CPVT, and then the yield for HCM and DCM are around 60 and 30% and for arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy between 40 to 60%. And so even if an individual has a postmortem diagnosis of say HCM or ARVC, postmortem genetic testing can still play a role. If a disease causing or pathogenic variant is identified in that individual, then known variant testing can be offered to at-risk relatives to determine their risk status and need for ongoing cardiac screening. In the case of sudden unexplained death, so either an autopsy isn't completed, um, there's no prior diagnosis to suggest what the cause of death might be, or the autopsy is negative, one of the most important things is collection of tissue and and or blood samples. Um, The National Association of Medical Examiners now has a recommendation um, for collecting and storing whole blood in an EDTA or purple top tube. It's important to interface with the medical examiners for the storage of this blood and then potentially for DNA extraction.
um, obtaining all pertinent medical records, of course, and in the setting of autopsy negative, sudden unexplained death, I think it's really important to consider a primary rhythm abnormality, specifically long QT syndrome and CPVT, in addition to Brugada, again, depending on the age and gender of the individual. As I mentioned before, cardiac channelopathy associated genes may reveal a genetic cause in a case of sudden unexplained death in up to 25% of cases. I mentioned this previously as well, but postmortem genetic testing can be helpful not only in unexplained cases, but when a heritable cardiac disease is autopsy confirmed so that known variant testing can be offered to family members. In the case of postmortem testing, insurance may cover the cost of testing, but it may be the responsibility of the family. Fortunately, with improvements in technology and flexibility of commercial laboratories, um, some of these gene panels can be offered at, at quite a reasonable rate and is not necessarily out of reach for, for many families. So just some key points to take with you about the inherited arrhythmias. Long QT syndrome, CPVT, and Brugada syndrome are common. Um, they can present with syncope, seizures, sudden cardiac arrest, and sudden cardiac death. The context of the event, uh, of the arrhythmic event, should really guide evaluation. And there are current consensus statements and guidelines recommending both genetic counseling and genetic testing for these conditions. Postmortem genetic testing should also be considered in cases of sudden cardiac death. Um, this can be valued both in cases of autopsy negative sudden cardiac death or when a postmortem diagnosis of a heritable heart disease is confirmed. I wish you all the best of luck in your evaluation of, of patients and, and treatment of patients and families with this inherited arrhythmias. Um, and thank you for your attention.